Welcome uh, to the 2021 Arkansas peanut production meeting. My name is Travis Foskey. I'm an extension plant pathologist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. And I'm proud to have been involved in the agronomic portion of our peanut production for the last nine years. I can't believe it. It's been nine years since we first started the renewed interest for peanut production in the state. And, and what a wonderful nine years it's been. Thanks for joining us uh, for this virtual version of our county production meetings. We've got a great group of panelists today. And they're eager to answer your peanut production questions. Uh, just as a note, uh, this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be available at the same page uh, from which you registered. For, uh, before, we, before we get started, uh, I'd like to just make a, a note that the, the number of CEUs for today is two for our certified crop advisors and our uh, Arkansas agricultural consultants. Um, the number of CEUs for crop management is 0 0.5 and we have 1.5 for integrated pest management. And please remember that to receive full credit, you must stay for the entire event. At the completion of all of our online meetings, uh, we will submit all of the CEUs for everyone who attended uh, that submitted their license numbers. That last meeting is on February the 2nd. So be patient. Uh, if you do have questions though, in the meantime, do not hesitate to contact Jerry Clemens. His email address is jclemons at uaex.edu. Or any of our panelists that you recognize, if you have questions, definitely reach out to us. Uh, first, if you've attended our, our corn and grain sorghum or rice or cotton meetings, welcome back. Uh, if this is uh, the first time you've attended, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, you to our production meetings. We hope that you find this uh, event uh, informative and helpful for the upcoming cropping season. We certainly all miss the in-person meetings and uh, I certainly hope, and we all do, that we can return to that uh, next year. But we still wanted to find a way to provide you some of our updated information and some of the results we had from this past season in hopes to help you with the upcoming cropping season. We've got four presentations today uh, going over updates from our extension specialists and educators. Uh, during the talks, keep in mind when you uh, want to ask a question, use the Q&A uh, box down below, uh, type in your question, and I will try to address those um, after each talk, if we don't get to it, don't worry. At the end of this, uh, all four talks, we'll have some time to be able to cover those questions that we didn't get to. So be patient, but definitely uh, ask questions. Be sure to ask me all the easy questions. Leave the hard questions for everybody else. So let's get started. Um, let's get to our first presenter, uh, the Extension Ag and Natural Resource Instructor, uh, Mr. Andy Van Gilder, and he's going to give us an update on some of his demo trial work that he did uh, this past cropping season. My name is Andy Van Gilder. I am an instructor A&R educator with the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture. Today I'm going to be discussing with you the peanut demonstrations that we conducted in 2020 and these were conducted on farm lodge block uh, areas in the farm which is something we haven't been able to do in the past and uh, anyhow we want to share those results with you. The demonstrations that we conducted in 2020 were we had variety demonstrations. I conducted two variety demonstrations. Uh, there were six variety hyolic type varieties in these plots. Um, we wanted to do a standard variety plot, but unfortunately we only really grow one in the state and can find and seed to conduct a test uh, to repair to it is not very easy. And so hopefully we'll be able to do that in the future, but we weren't able to this year. We've had some questions on plant growth regulators. So we conducted four uh, plant growth regulators. We looked at Apogee plant growth regulator in the state. Um, we also did uh, two demonstrations on gypsum on peanuts in the state. One of the reasons that we uh, are able to do that research is uh, the fact that we do now have a peanut way wagon. Uh, this is Chase Tucker standing from it, give you an idea of the size of it. Chase was my tech this summer to help me. And, um, Dr. Scott Montfort had told me about this, that he helped design it. So with the help of the Arkansas Peanut Growers Association, we purchased this wagon and um, then we added a self-lift system to it to where I do not have to bother a farmer for his tractor or pull a tractor around. We can pull up to the field, 
And in approximately 10 minutes, I'm set up and ready to go. And uh, my point here being that if there's something you would like to research on your farm, we will not slow you down much at all. Um, the farmers, I think, that worked with us this summer saw that it was really not that, didn't slow them down much at all. And I think they were pleased with that. So we can get some really good data and um, and not slow you much down the if you're willing to work with us. This is just a shot of showing what basically do. We bring the peanut, peanut combine over and dump on the way wagon. I can hold around 6,000 pounds of peanuts. And then we dump it into the, the uh, peanut cart. He can run to the truck with it and get back to the combine uh, if he's wanting to combine another part of the field that's not one of our reps or something like that. And, uh, and again, we can just uh, get a lot of good data and not slow you down any at all, much at all, if any. With that, we're going to talk about our first uh, variety, uh, plot, which is a peanut variety demonstration on the Greg Lyerly farm in Mississippi County. And appreciate Greg for working with us on that. And we had these six varieties in there. And uh, three of them, I think everybody's it's grown peanuts. It's for me with the flow front flow one three thirty one. Uh, did sixty four hundred pounds in this test. Georgia sixteen HO is a new one that uh, we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Sixty two hundred pounds on that. Our O nine Bs, which is pretty much our standard variety around, was fifty eight hundred, almost fifty nine hundred pounds. Fifty eight hundred pounds on the newer Lariat variety. We'll discuss more. Tough Runner 297, been around a while. It did 5,600 pounds. And then our TFNV, a variety we'll discuss more, 5,200 pounds. One thing I want to mention is in both of our variety plots, the 16HO, the Tough Runners, and the TFNV had a lower population in both the tests that we conducted in the variety test. And we don't know if this was a, a, a maybe a seed quality issue or a planter issue. We don't know for sure what it was, but we do know that we had a difference in, in that. And that spurred our interest in seeing, as you can see here, the 16HO, and you'll see in the other tests, uh, even though it had a low population, did well. So that spurred our interest, and in, we're going to 2021 conduct a uh, seed population test where we can see final populations and what they'll yield and help us to decide more in the future of do we need to replant a field or not, add some more seed to it or not, whatever. Uh, hopefully that will give us those answers next year. We also conducted these, this test, the same six varieties uh, in uh, Heath and Allen Donner Farms in Mississippi County. We appreciate their cooperation and working with us and getting this data. Um, we had one problem in this first rep where uh, the combine door came open. We were dumping peanuts and didn't know it, so we did not get the flow run 331 yield in that plot. Lariat, 6,300 pounds, 6,200 pounds for 09B. 16 HO, 6,000 pounds, a tough runner dropped down to 5,400 pounds, 5,500 pounds there or so. And then we're again around 52, 5,300 pounds with the TFNV. And our second rep, again, the same three, the 16 HO moved over the top in this one to 6,600 pounds, almost 6,700 pounds. Lariat and 09Bs, 6,200 pounds on 09B, 6,100 pounds on Lariat. The flow run, we, in this plot, we got 6,045 pounds. And, uh, and then we had we did dropped off 5,800 pounds with the Tough Runners, 4,800 pounds with the TFNV. Average those two reps together, our 16HO uh, did around 6,349 pounds. Both the Larry and 09B were in the 6,200 pound range. And again, we only had one rep of 331, so we have the 6,000 pounds of that. We don't know what it had done if we had two reps. Tough Runner averaged out at 5,600 pounds and our TFNV at 5,000 pounds. Now, I want to discuss some of the new varieties just a minute here. <clears throat> the 16HO uh, is a newer variety, and, and, uh, and, and as you can tell here, it has done well this past year. And Lariat also, it has done well. And uh, my point about these is, is as you are dealing with seeds, and I know you determine pretty much varieties uh, you're going to grow through the company you deal with, and if they offer you these, uh, these varieties, I think you should consider looking at them because they've got real good yield potential. One thing I want to mention about the Lariat it is a rather viney uh, variety, and so you may want to consider, especially if you're a 30-inch row guy, of using a plant growth regular to help you on uh, on uh, harvest efficiency. That's something you may want to think about. Now, the TIF NV, this variety is a variety that they grow more like in Georgia, and the NV stands for nematode and virus. It has a good virus package, and it is resistant to the peanut root, not nematode, peanut, excuse me, root, not nematode, 
And we obviously don't have that in Arkansas yet that we know of. We have the southern root, not nematode, which affects our cotton and corn and stuff and soybeans. That's one of the reasons why we grow peanuts on this ground, to reduce that number of root knot. And so this, my understanding, is about average yield for TFNV in that state. So we want to see what it would do here. And it's obviously not yielding up with the other varieties. And uh, But in a, in a sense, like in Georgia, where you really need that nematode control, that uh, seems like a good yield for them. But we probably won't be growing that much here. Okay, we're going to move into our plant growth regulator demonstrations. You know, Epigee and Kudos are the products recommended uh, for plant growth regulation. And, um, and uh, we used Epigee in these four plots we conducted. I got this shot from Dr. Scott Monfort. Um, this is just an idea when you're going to start applying Epigee on your peanuts. It's basically when 50% of the vines are touching uh, <clears throat> in the middles. You can see that here. That's the, about the approximate time you put your first shot on. And then you would go to uh, a second shot in approximately four weeks, um, excuse me, two weeks later, 14 days to two weeks later, you're going to put out your second shot. Now, uh, Dr. Montford had been playing with rates for several years, and he suggested to me that um, we could try on some of our soils a five ounce rate, two applications of five ounce. The labeled rate is two applications of seven and a half ounces per acre, and we have done both, and we're going to discuss that. Our first test was conducted over in Randolph County. I did that with, um, in cooperation with uh, Mike Andrews and the White, White Camps over there, and I appreciate their uh, participating with us. This was on a Bosket Brosley silt loam soil type, 30 inch rows, and we did two applications of seven and a half ounces per acre. In 2019, we saw that on 30 inches, the lower rates didn't seem to do as good as the two seven and a half ounce applications. So that's what we went with here, and what we see when we don't uh, apply this. The combine, when you're harvesting, has a tendency to reach over and grab the rows in the next uh, round of rows, and it'll put peanut vines over in there and kind of have a big wad. If you've ever combined soybeans and have a big wad, choke your header up. This is kind of what happens. Same thing with peanuts, and um, can slow your harvest down, gets aggravating. Our yields range in the upper fours to low 5,000 pound in this test. Really didn't see any yield um, advantage, any significant difference between the um, the Apogee applications in our check. So what we brought away, our observations from the White Camp Pop Apogee test was there was definitely a visual reduction of vines. Our digging time was reduced uh, and we could increase our digging speed by about half a mile per acre, excuse me, per hour, uh, half a mile per hour speed. And that way uh, we could dig a little quicker. We had a decreased volume of vines, which increased our harvest efficiency. What we saw where we didn't have it treated, it was slinging vines from the combine all the way over on the uncombined part, which means you're going to have to combine those again. We did not see that where we had it treated. We did not get a significant yield increase, but we did, uh, excuse me, we also did not see any significant differences in quality in this test. All right, moving over to Mississippi County on the Wildy Farms. We had looked at this product last year on their farm. We did it again this year on a Routon Dundee crevice complex soil type. It was uh, 38 inch rows, which is probably our most common uh, row spacing for peanuts. And we did two five ounce applications here. Now, our first plot, we only did a couple of reps, which is really not enough to get good, uh, good uh, statistics on this. And uh, Dr. Uh, Fosky ran the statistics on all these plots for me, and I appreciate him for that. And um, we didn't really get a significant difference in the yield, but as you can see there, there is quite a good numerical difference in yield in this plot. And in the second plot, the yields were more consistent, except for our second check. And uh, the Wildies told me they felt like they got into an area that may not have watered that good on that check. So that's the thing, things you'll deal with when you go to on-farm plots. But um, anyhow, we don't. We don't think we got any much difference in the second plot. So our observations this year were we definitely had visual reduction of vines. We reduced our digging time and, and again was increased our speed by about a half mile per hour. And um, we had improved harvest efficiency. And I know last year one of the things that Tab Will did told me was he said, I you know, I know we increased digging speed and I know the combine easier, but I felt like I was throwing peanuts out the back. And I think we pretty much proved that we're not doing that. Um, we did get some not significant yield increases, but some pretty good numerical yield increases in that one plot. And uh, we did not get any significant differences in quality of the peanuts. All right, on the, um, on the Apogee plot, in the, in the, we moved down to St. Francis County on Joe Whitman Farm. 
And um, this is on a Henry Loring silk loam soil type, 38 inch row spacing. We did the two applications of five ounces there. Uh, this was some pretty good yielding peanuts. We did four reps in this test and uh, they're in the mid 7,000 pound range to the low 7,000 pound range where we treated. Our checks dropped off and um, didn't quite yield as much. We had one that did, but the others did not. And uh, Joe says the soil type's pretty similar, so apparently it looks like we got a significant yield increase here. Now, one thing we did see on our observations was there was not near as much visual vine reduction. You could see it, but it was harder to see. And we've decided that probably on this heavier silk loam, uh, you know, type soil that, you know, it's kind of pushing the limit for putting peanuts on it. it really, they yield real well, but you, if you have a wet year, it's a little harder to get them dug. But if you're going to do this apogee on that type ground, I think that uh, you're probably going to need the full rate, two applications of seven and a half ounces on this type soil, I think. We're going to maybe look at that again this coming year. We did get a slight reduction in digging time. It was They dug a little easier, but not that much like the others, but it definitely did dig easier. Uh, just we didn't get a real big difference in time. We did get a significant increase here in this plot. Again, we did not get any quality differences in this plot. Our last one we conducted was also in St. Francis County. This was on West Higgins Farm. We had a Callaway silt loam soil type and uh, we had a 38 inch twin row. Wes has a 10 row operation there. And, and again, we appreciate Wes and Joe Whitten and all these guys for working with us on these plots. And um, he, we did two applications of five ounces per acre on this twin row field here in Wes's. You can see from here, our three reps of Apogee really did not see any yield difference, much um, not significant difference in yield on this plot. We did see the visual vine reduction. We were able to increase, uh, you know, or decrease our digging time, increase our speed, uh, again, by about a half mile per hour um, over what we were digging. You know, and, and this is any range, I didn't mention this, but basically you're running around um, 2.8 to 3 mile per hour is what a lot of people dig at. Some dig faster than that, and um, we did in this particular test. But you can increase that like to 3.5 mile per hour. You know, that's that what we were seeing to give you an idea of digging speed. There was no significant yield increase or there was no quality increases in this plot. Now, this is a shot from the Higgins Farm. This was the twin row. And this is a similar thing you'll see with a lot of different um, uh, soybean field, excuse me, peanut fields is you, you can't see the vines. Most farmers have a guidance system on their, on their tractors and therefore it is this very helpful. As you can see, it's hard to see your middles and, and to know where to dig and stay, so they let the tractor do that for them. Now, what we applied to Apogee, this is the two five ounce shots of Apogee, and you can see your rows much better. And if for some reason you don't have a guidance system, you can see it will help you be able to know where your rows are to do the digging. And um, so it's just one of the advantages we saw with it. Okay, our conclusion on Apogee plant growth regulator demonstrations is basically we know it reduced volume of vine, and we can reduce digging time, not always, but it did in most tests. It's going to improve harvest efficiency, and we saw that, that uh, we can increase yields. Most of our plots did not receive any yield increases, but um, some obviously did. And uh, it, it does not appear to reduce yields. That's one of the things we wanted to see. We did not reduce yields. Uh, we did not significantly affect quality of the peanuts. Um, this product is rather expensive. And you need to know that so you can consider whether or not you want to put it in your, in your uh, operation. A five ounce rate is about $40 per acre compared to the full rate running about $60 per acre for two applications of seven and a half ounces. So you do, do, need, do need to get some advantage with this. Now, one thing we kind of see is if you're a small type farmer, you may or may not want to spend this money. If you're a thousand to two thousand acre peanut farmer, which some of them are, then it may or well may have some application for you and your operation to help you increase your efficiency and, and, and uh, harvest time. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about, we did a couple of gypsum demonstrations on Greg Balt's farm in Randolph County. Again, I want to thank Greg and for working with us on this and Howard. Um, that, that helped us with it. We appreciate both of them a whole lot. Um, Howard Tillemeyer also helped us with this. He was the one doing most of the harvesting for us. In, uh, in this first plot, uh, we had a low calcium level in this farm. We soil tested it. We did not really see what we expected to see as far as a big yield difference. We did four checks in, in, in four reps of the gypsum. But we did have some interesting things I'll share with you in a minute. On our box, East uh, Farm, 
uh, one of the things we saw that kind of stuck out to me was if you see there where the four gypsum treatments were, the yields were very consistent. Now, um, Mike Andrews, uh, again, helped me with this in, in Randolph County. And he and a former extension agent in Lawrence County for years there, um, Herb Ginn, were doing this research in small plots. And they were seeing what looked like to be less dirt on the peanuts. And they got some increased yields is one of the reasons that spurred our interest in doing this. And when you walk out to the field, we actually flew a drone over this field and couldn't see any differences that way. But you could kind of see a slight difference in the amount of soil on the peanuts. And as you see the checks are they slowly increasing in the weight. And I'm not going to say this was yield because both Mike, Howard, and myself, and I was at the way wagon when they were dumping, there was a lot more dirt in these plots. And I really think this was dirt, not peanut yield. Can't prove that, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. The thing we did see on the Box West farm where the lower uh, calcium level was, it increased our uh, total sound mature kernels um cut about three percent and that's about 15 14 15 dollars an acre in price so uh, the gypsum we got it for about 50 dollars a ton and um you know we're shooting for a thousand pounds per acre i think we ended up at 1200 but if you get a thousand pounds out that's going to be 25 dollars an acre plus your application cost so it's kind of expensive uh, but, you know, what we saw here was is we may get quality issues in a low calcium field. Other states have seen yield increases even in high calcium on certain varieties. That's why we still need to do some research in it. But that's what we saw was possibly, you know, you may get some total sound mature kernel increases. And, um, and you have less dirt on your peanuts, which could be a little more efficiency and ease on your equipment. But that's what we saw there. Okay, what we came away with, again, was Balt West. We had no significant yield difference. Boss West had a significant difference in total sound mature kernels, which brought us a little money. We did not have any, uh, excuse me, we did see some significant yield differences, um, but I think it was in our checks, and I believe it was dirt, um, and we had no significant quality issues or differences in quality in the Boss East farm. Now, that farm was adequate when we soil tested it in um, in, in um, calcium, so that may be the reason we didn't see the cal the, uh, the quality issues. With that, that concludes my talk. I want to thank you, and, and I want to thank our county agents, um, Mark Andrews, Ray Benson, Chase Tucker, for helping me throughout the summer. I want to thank all the producers that allowed us to uh, uh, conduct this research on their farm. Without them, we couldn't do it. I want to thank Dr. Scott Monthert for his help throughout the summer, and I definitely want to thank Dr. Travis Foskey for his leadership and guidance for the last couple of years. And, uh, and most of all, we want to thank the Arkansas Peanut Growers Association for their financial funding, helping. Without them, we could not have conducted these plots, and we appreciate them very much. And with that, that concludes my talk. All right. Thanks, Andy. I really like that, uh, that dump wagon. That's actually pretty cool. So I hope to get to use it sometime. <clears throat> hey, there is there's one question, Andy. I think it'd be a good time to try to answer here. I think this is related to the Apogee. A uh, question was, do you see any health-related kind of issues uh, when you're using that Apogee, specifically on O9B? Uh, so do you see anything visually in the, the field or otherwise? I can tell you we had one plot of O9Bs, and that was the uh, plot at Pocahontas on White Camp. And as far as any difference in the, uh, the two plots, I don't remember any. We had some issues in that field that we had sent samples off. Uh, we finally just decided it was the upper end of the field we think it was just overwatering in that part of the field the bottom part of the field yield the field yielded well and as far as walking the plots i did not see any health differences I'm not saying it wasn't there but i did not note that okay that that works there's there's one other quick question i'm gonna try to answer there about the uh lsd or least significant difference was a statistical term was there really any differences among those and so i did the analysis uh, uh I'll, I'll try to handle that if the ANOVA is not significant, meaning it's not less than the, a P value of 0.05, we don't do an LSD. And, and on all of Andy's stuff, there was nothing uh, that really uh, had us do an LSD. But uh, um, we'll, we'll report on some of that stuff later, too, where you can actually see those P values if you want. So with that, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, move on here. So thanks again, Andy. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that there's a Q&A box. Uh, several of you have been looking at it. I know a couple other questions have come up since uh, we've talked here, and we will get to those uh, at the end of this uh, segment. So good use of that box. Up next, we will have uh, Tom Barber, uh, Extension uh, Weed Scientist, giving us an update on uh, weed management in peanut.
Hey, this is Tom Barber, Extension Weed Scientist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Today I'm going to be discussing some of our programs and, and weed control options that we have in peanut production. First off, I want to talk a little bit and just review our Palmer pigweed situation or Palmer amaranth populations in Arkansas. We know that we have developed resistance to several herbicide modes of action. Uh, we've had resistance to the yellow herbicides and ALS herbicides for quite some time now, and they're fairly widespread across the state, as well as glyphosate. Uh, also, for peanut producers, the big ones are PPO resistance and metolachlor uh, resistance. And if we look to the right in our map over here, these red counties are counties where we have identified populations of PPO resistant uh, pigweed. In addition, the county shaded in black uh, we have identified populations to uh, metolachlor, or at the very least, increased tolerance. And so with that in mind, those encompass the key herbicides that uh, we use for pigweed control in peanuts. So knowing what population of pigweed you have, knowing what has or has not worked in the last couple of years may help you decide whether you need to plant those particular fields uh, into peanut moving forward may need to rotate to something else such as such as corn. But uh, regardless, we know it's time now to diversify if you haven't included some different systems on your farm, uh, cover crops, deep tillage, seeding rate, or row spacing, again, can help us shade out pigweed. We're limited to this uh, a little bit with, with uh, peanut and cotton and some of our wide row crops. Earlier planting dates, though, can help us uh, get out in front of our heavy pigweed population. So anytime we can plant a little earlier uh, can help. A big one can be sanitation of our non-crop areas, ditches, turn rows, uh, equipment yards, and equipment, uh, different pieces of equipment to keep from uh, spreading our heavy uh, resistant pigweed from one field to the next. A crop rotation, which most of our peanuts, I believe, are grown in rotation. Uh, particularly with cotton uh, can help. But again, in both of those crops, we use some of the same herbicides to, to provide control of our pigweed population. So you kind of have to watch that. Uh, we can also optimize our herbicide rates. I think it's important moving forward, especially with the group 15s from a residual standpoint, we use the rate appropriate for the soil type uh, to get optimal control. The name of the game is seed bank management. And uh, we have a program we've run for a few years called Zero Tolerance in Cotton. Uh, but mainly this just uh, means we rogue what escape pigweeds that we have in the field, carry them to the turn row and uh, prevent them from going to seed in the field. Uh, with soybeans, we're looking at harvest weed seed control, but that's not much of an option right now in particular uh, with peanut production. So the idea is to prevent those populations of pigweed from producing seed uh, and adding to that soil seed bank moving forward. Now, much like all of our other crops, the foundation of a weed management program in peanuts is a function of residual herbicides and which ones we select and how good of a job we do with each uh, specific one. Talked about the yellow herbicides earlier, such as Prowl, Sonalin, uh, Prowl H2O. These can be helpful for specific weeds, such as Texas Panicum, uh, in my opinion, they're marginal at best on our, on our uh, pigweed populations in Arkansas. But the key for the activity of any of those yellow herbicides is incorporation, uh, either by tillage or by irrigation. And if we don't have overhead irrigation, I really would rather just use them PPI or not use them at all because I believe it's a waste of money, even though they may be cheap to put them out free uh, if we don't get incorporation rather quickly after application. Uh, the group 15s that uh, we're familiar with, dual outlook and warrant, uh, these can be applied pre-plant or pre-emerge. They'll sit on the ground and wait for a rain a little longer than, uh, or really a lot longer than our yellow herbicides will, seven to 10 days uh, before I start really reducing uh, control. Now we can have things emerge such as pigweed in that window prior to activation uh, but we can still get good activation and control uh, further out than the prowl, uh, as an example. Uh, if we think we're farming in fields that have metolachlor uh, tolerance, or our pigweed has metolachlor tolerance, 
you know, switching to something like Outlook, even though it's in a group 15 class, has proven to provide more activity on some of those pigweed populations. All these probably will go out in combination with Valor in the state of Arkansas. I know a lot, a lot of growers have, have more or less switched to those combinations uh, this last year. And, and uh, the group 15s can offer us some nuts edge activity as well. And we'll show that here in a minute. Uh, Anthem Flex or Zidua is in that same class, but we can't apply those until cracking uh, or in an early post type window. And again, for Anthem Flex, that rates four ounces. For Zidua, it's 3.25. Gives us good residual activity on most of our pigweed uh, populations. Because of the dire situation we're in with uh, pigweed management in peanut, and thus we have no uh, post-emergence options over the top once we have emergence other than gramoxone and so, or paraquat. And so we want to overlap these residuals every 14 days, more or less. If not, you know, we might can stretch it out to 21, but likely uh, if we don't have a post option in there at 21 days, we're going to have some emergence uh, prior to that time from pigweed. A uh, couple other herbicides I want to talk about from an app planting standpoint or pre Valor. Again, it goes on, it's my understanding, just about every acre. Uh, and strong arm is an option pre emergent It's an ALS herbicide. When we look at crop injury, we're going to get a little less injury from strong arm than we will Valor. It's a little easier to clean out of the tank. Uh, when we just look down our weed control spectrum, we can get a little more activity on morning glories. Uh, a few others, Eclipta. I talked to a lot of growers about Eclipta. Both of these have good activity on Eclipta. Uh, move down the list here. Nut sedge is another big one for us sometimes. I know it was this past season. So strong arm can option, uh, strong arm can offer uh, an option for residual control of yellow nut sedge, uh, something that Valor does not offer. One thing that we need to watch with strong arm is our rotational intervals. So corn and rice or sorghum for us, 18 months. Cotton is 10 months. And so uh, it's important to know when we apply this and stay within our, our plant back intervals to avoid any injury uh, to cotton. And it looks like we're not going to be able to rotate with corn uh, if we use it. Get a lot of questions on paraquat applications in peanut. Uh, peanut's one of the only crops we can use paraquat in post. And so at least of those that we grow in Arkansas. And so uh, the rate is 10.8 ounces of a three pound material. And uh, that's equivalent to two thirds of a pint. We get generally one post application by label. Uh, in Georgia, they recommend it mostly if they're not using Valor or strong arm because of our resistant pigweed populations, I believe we'll use uh, paraquat on every acre uh, just to control escapes, you know, in that uh, 14 to 28 day window after uh, cracking. And again, we need to apply it early up to 28 days after cracking. You know, uh, in Georgia, they recommend it going out by itself up to 14 days, or if we tank mix it with Bassagran or anything with Bassagran in it, such as Storm, we can extend that to 28 days because we see reduced injury uh, by adding that Bassagran in there. And I just mentioned all that can be tank mix with Bass Grand Storm, 24DB, exact 24DB or Zidua, et cetera. Uh, it's better if we put it out with more water with a nozzle that provides a finer spray droplet to give us better coverage and slow down on our application speeds, give us the best activity. And if we just look at some, as one example, I, I took a picture this past season following application, you know, we've got a morning glory escape here and there. And uh, when you zoom in, that's a way too big of a morning glory to be killing, even with a combination of, of Gramox on 24 dB and Storm. And so uh, we're not going to control these. Uh, this one to the right is getting a little big. These smaller ones we're going to control with no issue. And we knock the terminal out of this one, but we start to see a little regrowth coming already. And so it's important for our timely post applications uh, if we're looking to control uh, these escaped weeds such as morning glory. I, I get a lot of questions, you know, should we spray it with storm or without or with Bassagran or without? Uh, again, another picture from 2019. Later in the season, uh, you know, is there a little difference here in canopy development where we used or where we didn't use storm versus where we did? Maybe, but I don't generally uh, see a, at least the last couple of years I haven't seen 
a big difference you know, once we get later in the season in terms of, of canopy development. Get a lot of questions on cadre as well. And so cadre is an ALS herbicide that's used a lot in Georgia. Uh, again, it will give us activity on some of our nut sedge species that can be problems. Sickle pod, you know, it's one of the best options for sickle pod post. Uh, if we don't use cadre, we'd have to go with something like classic. And we know, you know, classic is not just great on sickle pod either. So sickle pod can be a problem for us. Uh, you know, if we're not going to use the cadre, but we have to ask if it's worth the rotational risk because we're not going to kill our ALS resistant pigweed with it and we're not going to get a clipta with it. Um, and our rotation to cotton is about 18 months. And you look at this picture on the right, a lot of times the cotton will come out of the ground fine, but once the roots start to grow and forage down, uh, they may hit a layer that's got some cadre in it. And so we can see that yellowing uh, later on typical ALS symptoms here. I did a replant study uh, behind various uh, significantly reduced rates of cadre applied pre to cotton and I couldn't find a rate low enough to not give me any injury. So I would just say leave it out, especially if you know you're rotating uh, to cotton the next season. Looking at some pre-emerge uh, herbicide comparisons, we talked about Valor Prowl being pretty popular up front or at planting uh, versus what I'd call a Valor Dual uh, system, you know, a group 15 versus the Prowl. And just at the, you know, at this window, we're looking strictly pre only, um, but just the difference in length of residual activity that we get uh, here with these two systems, I believe the group 15 is going to offer us a lot more benefit uh, than the Prowl or the Yellow when we spray it at planting. Again, I'd want that one in pre-plant incorporated uh, when we're building our beds and there's our untreated to compare to in the background. Uh, same year, 2019, Prowl by itself pre, followed by the uh, storm, Gramoxone, Zidua, you know, at 14 days after planting. Again, we had a lot of escapes and then come back and try to control them with Cobra and Dual. We did have select in here to clean up these grasses, but we did a decent job. We had some pigweed escapes that'll be with us uh, until harvest. But where we include that group 15, in this case, it was warrant, followed by the same post, except we substituted dual for Zidua. A much better uh, program for pigweed, uh, as well as grasses. And then again, for any of these escape grasses, we can come back uh, with select uh, to clean those up. Some pictures I took from this past season, 2020, here's our Valor plus Prowl again. And one thing we missed this season was the nut sedge. The yellow nut sedge took over any plots where we didn't have strong arm or a group 15, such as dual at planting. Uh, here we used Prowl, then followed it with the Gramoxone Storm Zidua. Uh, so Gramoxone was in this mix. We had you know, a little more activity on our nut sedge, but uh, overall, look at our pigweed escapes. And again, we just missed them with that gramoxone because of their size at time of application. So it's going to be crucial to have that Valor in the system. And as the same as it's going to be crucial to have our group 15 up front. Uh, this is 2020 outlook by itself. Did a pretty good job protecting early, followed with that gramoxone storm zidua at 21 days. Again, we've got some escape pigweed. All that boils back to is uh, just, you know, the outlook did a pretty decent job, but anytime we missed or we had one germinate on the on the edge of the bed, if it was too big at our gramoxone application, then we missed it. Uh, we have a lot better opportunity using both Valor and a group 15 like outlook, then following it with that. One thing you will notice though, with Valor, we get a lot less growth earlier. We have more stunning, more injury. Uh, when Valor is here versus versus not here with the same post. So again, uh, just to show you some examples, but I believe in our pigweed populations that we're dealing with, the Valor Outlook or Valor Dual or Valor Warrant at planting is gonna be a better option. Get a lot of questions on Eclipta. That's this weed we see right here. Uh, I, I don't know, some of the fields we started doing peanut research in, I had never evaluated Eclipta in the past. <laughs> Then we plant peanuts there and I've got a clip to everywhere. So um, we need to be in there with a strong arm or Valor does have activity pre. Cobra is about the best post activity I've seen 
Uh, some of the group 15s like dual can provide some residual, but I, I'd say it's marginal at best. So we need to make sure we have a robust app planting uh, residual to help us stay ahead of those uh, eclipto populations. We'll sw uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about brake herbicide. We've the last two years evaluated brake in our peanut production or peanut research uh, trials. And uh, as a pre-herbicide, we use breaking cotton in combination with cotter N and other pre-emerge herbicides to give us excellent control of Palmer amaranth. So we wanted to evaluate that potential in peanuts. The blue bars represent 2019, the orange bars represent 2020. One quick note, this is 14 days after emergence, a lot more injury in 2019 than we saw in 2020. And a lot of this we believe is just a moisture effect we had inches upon inches of rain in 2019, sometimes only two or three days apart. And so our plot stayed wet throughout the season, uh, especially early, and we just saw a lot more injury potential there. Again, with the 16 ounce rate, which we believe will be the labeled rate, not near as significant in the amount of injury and by, and in 2020, we didn't see near as much as we did in 19. Um, moved to 28 days after emergence, both years, very similar injury that we saw here. Again, for the rest of the, of the measurements, at least as we increase rates, a lot more injury in 2019, out to 28 days and beyond. Uh, when, we meet, when we mix it with Valor, again, 20, up to 20% injury in 19, didn't see that much uh, in 2020. Now Valor by itself caused significant injury as well, uh, both years and uh, out to 28 days. And so we're getting injury from Valor. Uh, it appears that the break injury, at least at 16 ounces, is, no, is not different than the Valor injury that we're getting at three ounces. What about the yields? And, and we were not able to harvest our plots due to the excessive amount of rainfall and the kill and freeze that we had uh, in 2019. But uh, in 2020, you know, we look at the break at 16 ounces, the 2X right here, not significantly different. This is the highest yielding plot. Break plus Valor, Valor by itself is less than the break uh, application, but again, uh, these will not separate statistically. Uh, and then our break at 64 ounces did. And so we got, some, this is a 4X rate. Uh, we do need to be careful with break and not get our rate wrong. We can see significant injury and uh, that will eventually result in yield loss. Just to show you what this may look like. Um, so this plot did not receive break. Here's our break at 16 ounces. Here's our break at 32 ounces. And here's another close up of our break at 32 ounces here uh, in a different plot. And so, uh, and then an untreated right here. And so again, we can, uh, we can see that uh, injury potential is there. We have applied for a section 18 for break in 2021. Uh, but again, I would tell you, if you're gonna try it, be careful with it. Make sure you get that rate right. We don't need to apply more than 16 ounces. The label rate is actually gonna be uh, 12 to 16 ounces on that section 18. And again, an up close shot. It's gonna be a lot like our rice and command uh, applications, I believe. You know, if we don't see a little bleaching on peanut, we may not be getting the activity we need but obviously we want to make sure that that rate is at or below 16 ounces so we don't see any significant uh, yield losses at the end of the year. So just to sum up our peanut uh, weed control systems, the first couple I'm going to talk about are really systems that are very common in Georgia. And I know some growers here have, have, have been on a couple of the, these two uh, as well, but Prowl PPI uh, in both of these, uh, followed by Valor Pre in the top one, and then the bottom, we didn't use Valor We just followed with Paraquat Storm and Zidua 14 days. But you'll notice in the top of where they use Valor in Georgia, they generally don't follow it with Paraquat. And, and that goes back to crop injury and you're gonna get some injury from Valor, but then again, you hammer it with Paraquat early post and you get more injury. So they usually leave it out. Unfortunately for us, uh, with the widespread PPO pigweed populations that we have, I think we're gonna need both. I think we're gonna need Valor and Paraquat. And so to me, a general recommendation for Arkansas would be, now, if 
we I don't have Prow PPI down here. If you want to do that, fine. But Valor Plus Dual or Outlook Pre could be worn here, followed by Paraquat Zidua Storm, 21 to 28 days after planting, followed by Outlook, Ultra Blazer, or Cobra if we need it here, plus 24DB. Uh, add select for grasses where we need that. And, and uh, you know, we talked about overlapping residuals with our group 15 herbicides, such as the dual outlook residuals. Uh, that's going to be, that's going to be important moving forward on our uh, pigweed population. So I think this bottom program fits our system a little better. We are going to injure some peanuts with this program. Now, if you're one of the 5,000 acres that gets to put breakout and you want to try it, it would be break at 16, 12 to 16 ounces. You know, we could do it plus a dual or outlook, or we could do it uh, plus that two ounces of valor uh, or three ounces of valor if we really wanted to stretch it. But again, uh, we could see some increased injury there. So with that, I wanna, I wanna say thank you for listening. I do have several groups I wanna thank uh, to help, that helped us tremendously with our peanut research this year. First, the pathology group, Dr. Travis Faske and Michael Emerson uh, helped us with planting and harvesting of our peanuts. I want to thank my crew that modified a lot of planting equipment this year. Uh, we had peanut trials over three locations, and so uh, they put a lot of time in modifying equipment to uh, prepare it for peanut production or planting and, and getting those plots in. So I appreciate their hard work. I want to thank the uh, Arkansas Peanut Growers Association for providing us a little funding this year to be able to look at some weed control programs for Arkansas producers. And my contact information is listed here. At this time, I'll be happy to take uh, any questions you may have. All right, thanks, Tom. Really good information. Uh, I always get that call, it seems like the beginning of the year about Zidua, is it pre or post? And I think uh, sometimes there's a little confusion about that, but I think you did a good job clearing uh, that up, especially in your summary at the end. <clears throat> um, with that, I, I, uh, I don't have any uh, immediate questions. I'm hoping some people are, are writing in to those. So we'll go ahead and move on to, uh, to Glenn. So thanks, Tom. Glenn Studebaker is our uh, extension entomologist. Uh, will give us an update on some of the uh, insect issues uh, we've seen in peanuts this past season. Hi, I'm Glenn Studebaker, extension entomologist and IPM coordinator with the University of Arkansas System. Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service. Today I'm going to be talking to you about managing insect pests in peanut. Here's a list of insect pests that we may see in peanuts in Arkansas. Uh, cutworms and lesser cornstalk borer are probably the most damaging of the caterpillar pests, while wireworms and the uh, rootworms are generally the most damaging of the soil pest peanuts. Cutworms and thrips will generally cause some level of damage on a yearly basis. Uh, last year, we did see several infestations of lesser cornstalk borers, as well, along with some uh, hot spots with some spider mites. We also detected peanut burrower bug, and I'll go into more detail on what we found last season later in this presentation. Let's talk about thrips. Thrips are common early season pests of peanut and other crops as well. Uh, these are very small insects, about 16th of an inch in size. And both the adult and immature forms uh, will cause damage on the peanuts by feeding on the terminal buds and the leaves of the plant. Heavy feeding can cause plants to be stunted, but the most damaging aspect of thrips is that they can vector uh, tomato spotted wilt virus to peanuts, uh, which can be quite damaging. The most effective management uh, practice to control thrips is to apply uh, infro insecticide at planting. So you have to make plans for your thrips management really before you plant the crop. Uh, growers have two options, thymet or granular insecticide that can be applied to infro or imidacloprid as an infro spray. Now, there are quite a few different brands and formulations of imidacloprid that are available and it's uh, usually not that expensive. It can also be mixed and applied with the inoculate at planting, making it a fairly easy option for growers uh, in, who grow peanuts. If a grower chooses not to uh, use an insecticide at planting, there are foliar options if thrips do become a problem. Uh, growers should consider treating 
when about 25% of the newly emerged leaflets are showing thrips damage, and they need to make sure that thrips are still present as well. This damage uh, from thrips is evident by silvering of leaves, uh, crinkled leaves in appearance, and uh, the leaves generally cup upwards when thrips feed on them. Uh, we also need to verify that the thrips are there uh, because there are other, other things that can cause uh, this type of damage, such as blowing sand, uh, herbicides, and other things. So do need to make sure that the thrips are present uh, when you see the damage. Now, as far as control goes, acetate or a pyrethroid will give some level of control. Uh, but keep in mind, these are broad spectrum insecticides and will reduce beneficial uh, insect populations, which can cause uh, problems and, and flare other insect pests, such as spider mites. Let's talk about spider mites. As I said, mites can be flared by insecticide applications. Uh, this is mainly because spider mites do have a lot of natural enemies that can help keep their populations in check. Uh, we did see some areas that were hit by mites last year. Uh, these were predominantly areas that are dry corners of uh, pivot irrigated fields or, or dry land fields. Uh, typical damage from mites will be yellowing of the leaves. Sometimes you'll see webbing up on the leaves and terminals when the populations are very heavy, as you can see in this picture right here. Options are limited for spider mite control in peanuts. Comite and bifenthrin formulations have been around for quite a while and are effective. Uh, Portal did receive a peanut label last year, adding another option for growers for spider mite control. Uh, just keep in mind that both comomite and Portal may only be applied two times during the growing season. Also keep in mind that proper application is very important to successfully control spider mites. These pests predominantly feed on the inner sides of leaves, making it difficult to get a miticide down there to them. Therefore, spray volume is very important. Uh, we would recommend using at least 15 gallons per acre with a ground rig, or if you're gonna use an airplane, five gallons per acre by air. Cutworms show up every year at some level in peanuts uh, in Arkansas. They often feed underground on pegs and pods, but will sometimes clip off seedlings early in the year. Typical pod damage results in large holes cut into the pods, as can be seen in this picture. Uh, the holes are oblong and larger than, than holes from, say, wire worms or, or corn root worms. Uh, cut worms are most active at night and therefore rarely are seen during the daytime unless they are dug up while you're checking the field. Pyrethroids do work well as long as the worms are still feeding above ground. Uh, Lower's band granules banded over the row will also give a decent control. Keep in mind that no more than 15 ounces of Lower's band may be applied per acre per season on a peanut field. Another important caterpillar pest that we see is uh, also lesser cornstalk borer. Uh, these borers are purplish, black, small, slender caterpillars with horizontal stripes going around the body. Uh, they're a lot more slender than, uh, say, a cutworm. Uh, these feed at or below the soil line on pegs and stems, and sometimes you will see them feed on, on pods, as you can see in this picture. And this picture was taken in Arkansas last year in a peanut field, so we did see some of them last year. Uh, they cover themselves with a silken tube that is often covered with soil particles or, or other debris while they're feeding to try to protect and hide themselves. Uh, we did see, uh, like I said, several areas this past year that were infested from lesser cornstalk borer, so uh, these are a big pest of uh, peanuts in Arkansas. Now, treatment for cornstalk borer should be initiated when you begin to see pig feeding in the field and the worms are present. Uh, because of where they occur, you know, down on the soil level, they are difficult, difficult to control with a foliar insecticide. Applying Lorsband granules at planting can help prevent an infestation. And if worms are present during pegging, a rescue treatment of Lorsband granules is about the only way uh, that we can control them. Lesser cornstalk borers tend to be more of a problem uh, in, in areas where the weather is dry and conditions are dry, such as the dryland fields or, or corners where a uh, pivot doesn't get to the, the plants. Uh, let's talk about another insect that's generally around every year at varying levels. That's the potato leaf hopper. Uh, this can be a problem if the populations do get too high. These are a very tiny sucking pests that feed on the leaves. Uh, they're only about a quarter of an inch long and green in color. Uh, some people call these things sharpshooters uh, because they are a way of the way they look. Uh, they do inject a toxin when they feed that can cause the leaves to yellow and fade a little bit. Uh, this condition is known as hopper burn. 
Uh, a metacloprid planning will help prevent populations or foliar applications of a pyrethra or acephate will control active infestations. Now, these things are fairly easy to control with a foliar application. All right, let's talk about peanut burrower bug. Uh, it's, uh, it can be a very damaging pest to peanuts, and it has caused some pretty significant damage in some years in, in uh, Georgia and Florida. It is a small black bug with the piercing sucking mouth parts, and it has a wide host range and uh, feeds on a lot of other plants, not just peanuts. As the name implies, this pest spends most of its life burrowed uh, below the soil line where it feeds on developing uh, seeds and pods. Uh, this feeding can cause yield loss as well as some seed quality issues. Because it is so small and stays below the soil, it's very difficult to scout for. Uh, it tends to be more prevalent in dryland production fields during years that experience uh, low rain field, rainfall. Uh, the only control option is, is Lohr's man banded over the row. Up until 2020, it was really not known if we had any peanut burrow bugs in Arkansas, uh, but the adults are attracted to light at night. So light traps are a good tool to determine uh, their presence. So we did deploy some light traps on peanut fields in four counties in Northeast Arkansas last year. Burrower bugs were captured at, at every location that we trapped. Uh, so we do know that they are here. However, we have really didn't detect any significant damage from these things. Uh, this is most likely probably because the majority of our peanut production is irrigated. And these things do tend to be more of a problem in uh, dry land or drought type conditions. Okay, to recap, there are several things to consider to successfully manage insect pests in peanut. An infro and ap application of imidacloprid or thymatid planting will help aid in reducing populations of soil burn pests, such as corn root worm, wire worms, uh, white grubs fall into that category as well. Uh, these also work very well at suppressing seedling pests, such as thrips and potato leafhopper. Now, Lohr's bandit pegging will help control cutworm, uh, lesser corn stalk borer, and burrower bug if infestations are present. Remember, you cannot apply any more than 15 ounces of Lorsman 15G per acre per season. All of our recommendations for peanut insects can be found in the row crop section of MP144, the Insecticide Recommendations for Arkansas publication. Now, the updated publication for 2021 is available in print at your county extension office or you can go to online to find a downloadable PDF version on the extension website, which you can see at this link shown here in the slide. Uh, there's also a mobile friendly version that is easy to see on a, a mobile device. that can also be found at the other link there where it says uh, mp144ux.edu. This concludes my presentation on peanut insect management. If you have any questions now, or later during the growing season, here's the contact information for all of our extension row crop entomologists in Arkansas. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Pretty interesting kind of <clears throat> cool insect year. Um, I, I, I did have a question for you regarding to uh, the spider mites. <clears throat> when I saw them last year, it was like on one edge of the field, maybe six rows, maybe 12. Uh, does a does a farmer need to spray the entire field, or or how would you recommend, or can they get away with spot treating? Uh, that's a good question, Travis. Uh, we can get by with spot treating on spider mites. They do tend to be on in certain areas of the field, uh, but I have seen them all the way across there. But yeah, if they're just on one edge or in a in a spot that drops in on the field or a corner, uh, spot treatment is is an option. Uh, you want to make sure you don't just treat right where the damage is. Uh, probably treat, uh, you know, another swath over, uh, you know, get another 50 to 100 feet over uh, because there are some mites that will be migrating out of that area. But, yeah, that, that does save them some money if they can do it that way. Yeah, sure. It's, uh, anything by that time of the year usually is helpful. What uh, question on the, the, the lesser corn stalk borer. <clears throat> if, if I found it in the field, in a corner of a field, and I go back, three years, is, is that a, a good chance it's going to be in that same general area like soilborne diseases, or is it a, a more migratory, you know, maybe, maybe not type of thing? Uh, that, that one is a, is a lepidoptera, so the, the adult is a moth or butterfly, so they, they do not necessarily stay in the same area like some of our soilborne pests. Uh, 
not like wireworms or grubs that may live in there for two or three years. So they come in every year. So if they're there this year, they may not be there next year. That's it, more keyed into more of conditions. They tend to like sandier, drier type soils. So uh, that's why they like peanuts. It's, it's kind of soil we tend to grow it in, but they tend to be worse in, in drier years, but you know, that's, that's not, not the rule of thumb all the time. But, but, uh, yeah. I, I certainly was impressed to find some this year myself and that, uh, that setup you have for that burrow bug, um, I, I think I had a few people call me and ask me if that wasn't some alien landing off in the field that when it's lighted, lit up at night. That was quite impressive. Uh, I, I didn't get to view it, but uh, they were a little concerned. Yeah, they do look a little eerie out there. It's a field with that black light on them out there. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, if you have any other questions for Glenn as uh, we get to our last presentation, definitely uh record those in the Q&A box and, and we'll get those uh, uh, to the end. So I'm your uh, final uh, presenter for today. And so uh, the next uh, talk will be about uh, peanut diseases. Hi, my name is Travis Foskey. I'm an extension plant pathologist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. In this session, we're gonna talk about peanut diseases and their management. Although uh, a lot of the peanut diseases we have in the Mid-South or the South Central region are, are similar to those in, in other peanut growing regions of the U.S., our management is, is, is certainly a little different um, and we're going to talk about some of those differences today. I, I like to start out just kind of a, a quick review um, and it kind of helps to set up some of our disease issues that we had for the year. So we, we had kind of a cold start, um, but we had uh, uh, low emergence um, initially, uh, very slow, uh, really thinner stands than what we would uh, normally expect. During the summer, we were much hotter, much drier. Um, we had some areas that probably didn't uh, canopy up and, and maybe had some weed issues. Uh, we contributed some insect issues. First time I saw uh, uh, spider mites and, and very severe sp spider mites in some cases. So uh, certainly something different every year and in, in why our management uh, in, in the South Central region is different. And then of course, uh, something that others did not have to deal with is, is hurricanes. We had six, six tropical storms for those after uh, August the 26th. And, and there was some concerns about harvest uh, again. Uh, we had a cool end to the season that, that kind of slowed some of our maturity and, and our grades were a little lower uh, and some had to wait a little bit longer to get to the grades they wanted. This is our uh, production system over the, the, the past 10 years. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, amazing. We've been growing peanuts for 10 years in the state. Uh, we've been primary peanut producing state for, for several years now and, and we continue to increase uh, our production. With an increased production for a plant pathologist really has me focusing on disease management uh, because that is certainly uh, one of the ways that we uh, sustain production within the state and continue some of our higher yield production and high yield quality. This past year, although the, the USDA has, uh, I think, uh, 39,000, I, I, I calculate about 38,000 and I'll agree with the uh, the yield about uh, our average is about 48,000, which is which is good for the number of acres we had and, and a lot of new farmers included in that. So that's really good. These are these are the diseases. Uh, again, some some people struggle with these in other regions in, in our area. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of variation. Uh, Southern blight is, is, is very common uh, across the uh, uh, peanut growing regions of the U.S. Sclerotinia blight, a little more specific. Um, I, I usually spend time talking about this, but uh, given the duration of this virtual meeting, I'm not able to this year. Pod rot complex, uh, certainly a concern. Seedling diseases, aspergillus crown rot, something we see early in the year. Uh, some areas are seeing more problems with this. We have not yet. <laughs> Verticillium wilt, uh, certainly a concern in our, our cotton growing uh, region of the state. And Diplodia crown rot, something I haven't talked about before, uh, certainly something we saw last year, so I'll talk about that for the first time. Leaf spots, I really think late leaf spot is our main issue. Uh, initially, we saw some rhizoctonia foliar blight, which again is, is different for our area than others. Really not a, a yield limiting disease, but uh, the first time you see it and it has these long cat-like um, hair type hyphae uh, matted in, in the canopy, it looks pretty, uh, Pretty dramatic, uh, but it, it's not really uh, that yield limiting. And of course, leaf scorch. 
I'm not going to be able to talk about all these diseases, uh, but, but if you're interested in those and some pictures, you go to the Arkansas Plant Disease Management page on the UEX website, uh, click on the peanut icon, and it'll bring you to a link that has some of the peanut diseases and descriptions and some of the management there and some more photos. These are our uh, uh, peanut uh, growing counties. Mostly it's in the, the Delta region. Um, initially, uh, when we first started in 2010, most of it was in Lawrence Randolph. Now it's moving into Craighead and, and Mississippi County where, where the main production is and also that in Lee County. Uh, because of the length of the production and some of the other uh, cropping systems, uh, some of the disease pressures are a little higher in, in Lawrence and Randolph. And uh, we're still a little bit lower in, in uh, Craighead and Mississippi, but that is certainly something that's going to pick up with uh, continued production. Uh, runner peanuts are our mainstay. Uh, we've had a few Spanish in the past, but I think uh, this is probably where we're going to uh, continue. Most of it is 06G. You can see uh, I estimate about 80%, uh, about 17% O9B. So that's a high oleic. Um, and then these others are also uh, high oleic peanuts as well, but, but all of them runners. Tough runner 297 and flow runner 331. Uh, start out with just uh, uh, choosing the right variety is also a, a, a critical uh, selection when it's talking about peanut production. Uh, this is just a variety trial we've done for the past couple of years just to give you an idea of, of how these varieties uh, perform. Uh, it's easier to do a small plot and fail than having a field wide test and fail. So this is a we planted late, of course, with the COVID-19 issues and uh, we were uh, actually even wondering if we were going to be able to get out and plant. And so uh, uh, we did a little bit later than normal. Uh, Admire Pro, this is our metacloprid and our inoculant exceeds. Uh, certainly important to make sure that uh, the, the rate here, uh, you know, this was 14 ounces. Some of the inoculants uh, that I've used, it's a lot less. So uh, be sure when you're looking at inoculants that you're using the right rate. Uh, also, uh, sometimes the, 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 the box is one I open. Um, I've seen some of them a little more discolored than others. I, I would kind of avoid those, make sure that uh, uh, they look like uh, they're supposed to instead of have something other funky floating in those uh, uh, bladders. Our target was six seeds per foot, uh, which, is, which is normal for my production system. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the farmer, the, the producer here, uh, it was his uh, fungicide program, chlorothalonil tebiconazole. And I think that was three that were used in this trial. So pretty low disease uh, risk. Uh, cropping system, we followed cotton, but it was a cotton, cotton, peanut rotation. And we harvested on the uh, November the 5th. So uh, much cooler at harvest. Uh, and here, this is a, a plot thrasher uh, where we actually just feed the, uh, the peanuts in here and collect the, uh, the pods at the end. And that's what this individual is doing here. Diseases were pretty low. Uh, it was interesting that Southern Blight did pick up uh, just right before Laura moved in in the region in, in August of 26. We, we got really warm and hot and dry in August, and, and I think the, uh, the warm conditions really stimulated the, uh, the Southern Blight. And we did a rating um, kind of late in the season about uh, uh, end of August. This is our trial. Uh, they're ranked based on yield. So the ones that are on top actually yielded the best. First, just talk about the stand. Um, here we have uh, uh, some stands are pretty low. This is about flow run 331, about 40% of, of what we'd expect. Uh, but some of these others uh, certainly were, were much higher at about 72%, uh, which is Georgia 07W. Uh, no really interaction with the uh, high oleic or the standard peanuts. The two standards here are 06G and 18RU. Um, and and this, this seed all came from foundation seed. So it's really high quality seed, um, but I think our environmental conditions were just not favorable for our production. So um, uh, I know there was some seed quality issues, but uh, this kind of suggests to me the environment had a, had a major factor also uh, in some of our thinner stands. All of these are over 50% and I'm, I'm, I'm usually targeting at the end, if I have three plants per foot, I'm, I'm gonna stick with it. And even those those that were low, like the Tough Runner 297, actually did pretty good with yield. So uh, I don't think we lost anything there. This was interesting with the disease incident for Southern Blight. So this is the percent of that plot that was infected. The lowest was, uh, well, I guess 06G was uh, one of the lower ones. Actually, 16HO and 331 were the lowest, uh, as well as Lariat. 
and Lariat possibly because of its kind of upright growth habit. Um, 16 HO is a Howell Lake that some were actually interested in, uh, actually did well here. And the, uh, uh, the most susceptible variety was, was 09B. And that's, um, that's understandable. And that's something we've seen in other trials and in uh, uh, other regions. So that kind of follows along that same uh, 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 rating system. Yield wise, uh, O6G actually did the best at over 7,000 pounds per acre, uh, had a pretty good stand, but even those that had a high stand uh, really didn't out yield the uh, O6G. Almost everything else kind of fell in the middle. The 18RU was pretty close to the O6. So if you're looking for another standard peanut, could be an option. Um, Georgia 12Y, uh, 16HO uh, looked pretty close to 12Y. The last couple of years have done a little better than the 16HO, but uh, still respectful yields for a uh, variety of trials. We did take uh, grades from one replication and, and had those processed uh, at one of the buying points. Um, the, the Georgia uh, 06G actually did the best. I, I think that had to do with a little bit of our maturity. Sometimes 06 is, has a little bit lower grade uh, when we have uh, years like this where the maturity is a little bit delayed, but um, in this trial, it actually looked pretty close. It was uh, four points higher than, than 09B, and that helped to have it a little bit higher value per acre but all the others did pretty well. 18RU was 76, Lariat 77, 16HO 76. Again, there's no stats here because these are just um, single data points. Um, and again, the value here, the, the, uh, there's no, this is just loan value. So there's no um, additional uh, price per acre based on high leg or standard peanuts. So uh, you can add that in there and that does give something like uh, uh, 07W, probably a little bit of an edge, but uh, but not by much. Okay, so um, 09B, more susceptible, something we would certainly be concerned about if we had a Southern Blight. So Scrotium Rothschild, Southern Blight, Southern Stem Rot, or White Mold, they're all the same same thing. Um, the, the, the environment that we, we really see this is hot conditions, uh, usually field history, and then uh, susceptible varieties. So usually July 1st, we'll look for some flagging. Uh, if you pull away the canopy, sometimes you can see this uh, white hyphae, uh, usually a little thicker, coarser than some of the, the, the other hyphae, especially a little coarser than what we see with sclerotinia blight. And then finally, uh, the sclerotia. And so uh, these are really small, like uh, number four shot, uh, lead shot. So you're looking for something really small, but uh, they're, they're white at first, and then they mature to something brown or tan, and then kind of a reddish color. So uh, this kind of tells you that this has been out here for quite a while. Um, if you go out right after a heavy rain, it's really hard to find these. It's really hard to see the high T2, even though you can see some of the, uh, uh, the flagging going on, the symptoms of the plant. Early on, typically in June, um, it's, it's not uncommon to see this Southern Blight imposter. This is Phanerochete, uh, sometimes called, a, it's related to the tooth fungus. It's a wood rotting fungus. Um, and you can see why it's called a tooth fungus. You see these uh, kind of tooth-like projections here. Um, initially, right along the edge here, you can see how it can be confused for Southern Blight. Uh, the, the, the other key thing that jumps out to you is the, the yellow color. Um, that takes a little while to develop. So early on, this is, uh, it, it can be confused. Oftentimes, if I find one spot that has this, keep looking, keep looking, and you'll finally see some that has that yellow uh, discoloration. Uh, even sometimes pulling up the plants, uh, you'll actually see this uh, kind of the uh, uh, subterranean uh, below the soil line. Um, something talking about subterranean um, uh, diseases, Southern blight can also, um, kind of stay below the soil line. So you don't see the hyphae, but once you dig, you can start seeing the, uh, the hyphae on the, uh, the limbs here. Um, you can also see some of the rotted pods. Uh, primary, this has to do with the, the fungicide not getting down into the soil. And this is what we're trying to protect. This picture was taken from uh, outside the, uh, the pivot. So close to the dry line corners. And, and this is what's happening. We're just not getting the, the fungicide down into the soil. So typically a fungicide program, we're gonna start sometime around July 1, that's about 60 days after planting for most. 
continue at 14 to 21 day intervals. 21, if you have a, a low risk, 14, as you're getting into a higher risk or uh, conditions are more favorable for disease development. Warm, uh, uh, typically wet weather is, is gonna be more conducive for this disease. And of course, field history. It's so best if watered in um, with a pivot, so that makes it much easier if you are furrow irrigated. Um, at night, the uh, leaves fold up, and so spraying it at night can, can direct the fungicide down lower into the soil canopy, which can be uh, helpful to get it uh, close to that uh, soil surface um, and uh, hopefully being washed in at some point. I, I know that's, uh, that's a challenge at times, uh, planning for a rain, and then it typically doesn't rain, and that's, that happens to me too. Typically, we expect about 70 to 75% control. Um, fungicides are not herbicides where we're killing everything. Uh, we're protecting the plants that are there and sometimes we can't see the infection. Once you see the symptoms, the infection's already taken place and, and there's no cure for that plant anymore. These are some of the uh, fungicides. Uh, most all are very good. The, the uh, efficacy here, take a look at the MP154. Uh, Convo we've looked at for years, and then uh, something like Bravo uh, has no activity against Southern Blight. But uh, all of these others uh, tend to do very good or, or good, uh, so it depends on what's available to you. Risk level, uh, low risk is, is uh, what we've been doing for a number of years, getting away with probably three fungicides. If we've had peanuts for a couple of years, we may need to move into a moderate risk. I, I don't think you need to change up and find a very expensive fungicide, but maybe just add another fungicide uh, to your program. And of course, we talked about the risk, field history. Do we see the Southern blight? Uh, are we growing O9B uh, environment around July 1? Uh, you know, of course, this past year, uh, most of the uh, Southern blight showed up very late, but I think the fields that were protected earlier and then we've got the fungicide down into the soil line, uh, that's where we still saw that protection. It's hard until August the 26th to get a fungicide down to the soil line with the dense canopies that we often have in Arkansas. And of course, rotation. Uh, this is a two year rotation with peanuts, um, uh, probably not the best. Uh, when you have low disease pressure, it's not bad, uh, but this is more of a sequence than really a rotation. Either uh, corn or, or, or cotton is, is uh, suitable here. Um, this is three year rotation, the one we have with our variety plots. Uh, Works great for managing nematodes. Uh, southern root knot and reniform drop with the uh, peanuts and then uh, pick up again with uh, the cotton. You do have to add uh, corn in the production system and you're managing nematodes. Um, the, the cotton is probably the most uh, affected by uh, southern root knot or reniform. So following peanut would actually be the best. Um, a reniform does not reproduce on corn, but root knot does. So if you uh, follow um, cotton after corn, uh, that can be more problematic for uh, nematode management. Soybean, um, I, I know that happens in some cases, it's not ideal, uh, especially here you have two legume crops to, together uh, that can cause some problems for some diseases. This would be a little bit better if you're breaking up something between the legume crops, um, uh, like uh, cotton between it here or, or corn between it uh, would be better. Sometimes that's a challenge for that long of a rotation uh, giving uh, uh, changes in commodity prices. This is, uh, this is why we really don't want uh, soybeans and peanuts following each other. Uh, this field has an issue with uh, southern root knot nematode and southern blight, but this is all southern blight on soybeans. And so if you would plant peanuts in this field, uh, certainly you're going to have uh, uh, some, some southern blight issues. It'd be better to come in with corn and then uh, follow that uh, with peanuts. Uh, last couple of diseases, this is uh, diploidy cholera, fairly common in 2020, um, had a lot of consultants right around the digging time, uh, saw plants that just kind of died down and, and we're wondering what's going on. Typically these are more scattered, uh, where southern blight you may see a big group of them here that are dead. There tends to be one here and one there with diplodia, associated with extreme heat and drought, and we, we had both of those this past year. This is caused by uh, Lassa diplodia, uh, Theobrome. Uh, the synonym is diplodia uh, gossipina. And, and this is a, uh, a relatively common fungus. This is not the same one that causes the diplodia ear rot or leaf streak on corn. That's stenocosparella, um, stenocarparella, excuse me, macrospora. Uh, 
And uh, so if you're growing corn and, and peanuts in the same field, there's no really concern about that being a, a problem in the rotation system. So these are, these are two different uh, this, uh, fungi. Typically we start uh, seeing the plodia on these lower limbs uh, and, and typically in, in areas that are thinner uh, than dense. So uh, that's, that's pretty common. You see these uh, limbs are starting to, to wilt here. Later on, uh, kind of the image before, within a few days after seeing this, uh, these plants will die. Uh, something that, that I was not aware of, one of the, the symptoms here is this slate gray color. This, this picture was sent me by a consultant, Greg Smith, and, and I was not really familiar with what I was looking at until I looked through some of the literature and had time. But uh, this slate gray kind of gives an indication that would be the floating colorado. Uh, a closer inspection, there is some uh, fungal fruiting bodies called pignidia that can be seen uh, on these plants. Some of these were sent to the plant health clinic in Fayetteville and Sherry Smith diagnosed them at Colorado. So uh, that kind of helps to confirm that. The, uh, the, the, the taproot can kind of have a grayish dull color with some lesions, but again, we're not seeing that so much here in this image. Uh, often a weak pathogen and really needs some help to get in. Here's the help that it often gets is tomato spotted wilt virus. Uh, here we see those concentric rings classic for tomato spotted wilt. Here's why it happens sometimes in the lower canopy. You see the tomato spotted wilt symptoms here, here, here. Not so much up above, uh, although typically viruses go to the, the, uh, the newest growing point. I didn't see that much this past year, but this is why I think we see some of the diplodia down below. I don't think we're going to control the plodia, uh, but, but we do need to control our tomato spotted wilt. And I think that's why we were seeing so much diplodia this past year. Uh, tomato spotted wilt associated with thin stands, which we did see transmitted by thrips. Um, I think some uh, did get out there midicloprid on time, but it took so long for those plants to come up. I'm not sure how much uh, they picked up and how much thrips control we really had. So uh, potentially had a few more thrips and then had more tomato spotted wilt. Not all uh, cultivars show the same response to tomato spotted wilt. Uh, and, and oftentimes this is kind of a rarity to walk in the field and see that, uh, but that was actually my variety plots this past year. So management, focus on managing tomato spotted wilt, uh, getting the, the, uh, the plant population up, our, our good stands, uh, the thinner the stands, the more tomato spotted wilt. Fungicides are not effective, so that's not gonna be good, but. Uh, there's some variation among cultivars, not only for tomato spotted wilt, but also for Diplodia uh, cholera. The last disease I'm going to talk about quickly is, is, uh, is actually a, a contamination issue more than a disease. It's, it's aflatoxin, and this is produced by fungi that uh, uh, Aspergillus flavus and Parasiticus, um, and only the toxigenic strains actually produce this. So this is uh, regulated by the FDA and EU. Um, if it's uh, a peanut, raw peanuts, it's 15 parts per billion. If it's uh, a, a peanut products, peanut butter, it's 20 parts per billion. And the EU has a little lower regulation, which may be why some of the buying points actually, uh, uh, actually have a lower threshold uh, than the 20 parts per billion. The fungi invade through wounds uh, anytime during pod development. Um, here, I'll just jump in this middle picture here. We have a lesser corn stalk burrower, burrow, borrower. It's feeding on this uh, pod, and you can see that that would be a wound that would uh, allow the, the fungus to get in. Here you can see some of the damage from the uh, lesser corn stalk borer. Here we have uh, uh, some of the uh, plants that were picked up from uh, this area. Uh, this is a small pod, uh, and if you open it up, this is the aspergillus. I don't know if that's aflatoxin or if it's producing aflatoxin. All I know is, is that's aspergillus. And then when conditions are hot, uh, dry a lot of conditions right before harvest. Uh, this fungus uh, could, if it's a toxigenic strain, produce aflatoxin. Uh, now this pod is really small. You can see here, it probably went out the back of the, the combine, uh, but the larger pods that are infected is, is where we get our aflatoxin. So um, hot, dry conditions about three to four weeks before harvest is, is the critical time where uh, the, the plants are stressed and the fungus, for whatever reason, produces uh, aflatoxin. Um, so if three to four weeks, if you expect to dig by October the 15th, September 25th to September 3rd is the critical dates. And, and here we see that dry, uh, dry land corners uh, that was pretty common for this past year. 
uh, Laura and, and well as uh, Tropical Storm Beta probably helped us out a little bit maybe uh, coming in at the, the end of August and September, providing us a little bit more widespread rain. But I, I do think that uh, uh, farmers stuck to their plan and, and leaving out some of the dry land corners um, to, to keep our aflatoxin issues very low. I expected it to be much higher and it was almost uh, um, absent completely. There was uh, late in the season, there was some trailers uh, that did have uh, aflatoxin. Again, that's probably uh, those dry land corners that were left in the field and harvested at the very end of the season, which was uh, a good plan. Uh, certainly the aflatoxin was less than what we expected. There's really no effective control other than irrigation and uh, uh, that we do as, as well as we possibly can. And also uh, like leaving out the dry land corners was, was certainly a good plan for this past year. There is some uh, Afligard products uh, like it's used in corn. Uh, it's just uh, inconsistent trials uh, in peanuts. So uh, I, I prefer the, uh, the irrigation component here. All right, with that, I, I would like to thank the, the Arkansas Peanut Growers Association uh, for supporting some of this work, the National Peanut Board too, uh, supporting some of the research projects here and, and others I wasn't able to talk about. And then of course, uh, Birdsong and Delta Peanuts uh, uh, that were Really great to work with, either providing seed or birdsong, doing some of the grading work here. Uh, it's a really great group of, of individuals to work with, and, and I'm proud to be a part of the um, Arkansas uh, peanut production system. And uh, thank you. I hope you found this information helpful and informative, and uh, we'll see if we have time for questions. All right, welcome back. Um, there are a couple of questions in the, the Q&A box, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll just pitch those to myself. So what about wheat uh, if, a, if a person is not able to add cotton in a rotation? <clears throat> and I'm, I'm glad you sent this early. It gave me some time to think about it. My concern for the producer would be the timing that you're actually going to be planting the peanuts. If you're harvesting wheat in June, um, that would be getting late as far as planting peanuts. We'd like to plant those between April 15 and May 15. Bone, most of the reason would be uh, harvest timing. If you're bumping into November, it gets wet, I'd be concerned about getting that out of the field. Uh, obviously, if you rotate completely around, if that's your idea, uh, certainly you could add that into a rotation, but that would be uh, my concern. If that doesn't quite answer, if you had a different uh, uh, thought about that, uh, please revise your uh, question and you can put it back in the box and we can try to, to address it uh, shortly. <clears throat> uh, there was one question again uh, about the, the Afligard type materials in, in peanut. Uh, yes, they're, they're registered. It's in the MP154. We just don't have enough data uh, utilizing it that it actually reduces the amount of aflatoxin. It's uh, hard for me to understand how the product works if you're sprinkling the, um, the product on top of the ground and then the infections occurring in the pods below the ground, um, I think that adds to some of that inconsistency of how that's actually functioning and working. Anybody that I've asked within the university system about how, how did it work for you? Um, it was mostly, um, we don't really have good trials with it. Uh, the time you put it out, there's no aflatoxin, um, which often goes with some of my trials too, so. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there with, uh, there's a couple other questions we'll get to in the Q&A. Um, but we'll just stop that. That's the end of our, our four presentations. Um, I hope you found that information helpful. Before we move to those, I, I'd really like to thank our faculty and staff. I know each one of our presenters mentioned individuals in their respective groups that they thanked, and uh, of course, our peanut producers. Um, that was really helpful that we had this past year, not only from the Arkansas peanut producers and the support through the Arkansas Peanut Board, I think gave everybody on this panel some funds to work with to actually try to generate some data that was presented here. So I think that was uh, well done. Also like to thank the National Peanut Board, which also supports this group. Um, and that's uh, uh, without that type of funding, we couldn't do some of these trials and present some of that information here. So I hope the, the, the farmers here saw the benefit from our, uh, their checkoff dollars here. Also remember that the uh, CEUs, uh, will be submitted after all of our production meetings are completed. 
for those who provided their license numbers when they registered. If you did not submit your license number and, and want to receive credit, please email your information to Jerry Clemens at jclemons at uaex.edu. And uh, now we'll go into our uh, question and answer section. Uh, if you haven't already uh, and you wanna submit a question, please use the Q&A box below and we'll do our very best to answer all those. Um, I, I think we certainly will have time to answer any of your, your questions that you might have. Um, and I'm gonna go back here to the list here. Um, and, and Andy, this one kind of uh, gets back towards you. Um, and I think you're trying to address some of this for the, the upcoming season. So uh, it, this goes into questions about calcium. And I know you did some trials with the, the gypsum materials and some of those have been hard to come by in the past. And I think with hopefully continued peanut production that may be easier, but are there other forms that you're looking at or interested in maybe for the upcoming cropping season? I have, you know, we have questions about it a lot and, Everybody I've talked to says all the, the, the plots done on foliar calcium, calcium have seen no results, uh, you know, as far as helping the yield. And so we do have some more growers interested, have expressed a little interest in looking at the gypsum. So anybody that wants to look at that, we'll be wel welcome to do that. Um, the foliar test, like I said, we have not had anybody. We've had people asked about it, but I hadn't had anybody conduct it. That's pretty much where we are on that right now. Hopefully, uh, hopefully some of those become easier. Um, I, I do see a lot of fertility companies providing a lot of other uh, fertilizers. So that's uh, uh, can certainly be uh, uh, an additive point there. Um, I'm just gonna try to clean up a few of the, the, the questions here that I have. Some was related to the, the susceptibility of the uh, 16HO and Andy, I might refer back to you and see what you saw this year. I'm gonna first just talk about what I saw in my trials. Um, and specifically was 16HO compared to O9B. Those are both high oleic peanuts. O9B we've got a long history with and 16HO is relatively new. I know I showed in my presentation that uh, there was some uh, Southern blight with the uh, 16HO. Uh, we just haven't had enough years to really look at it to see what kind of uh, problems we might have with it with other diseases. I would assume it's gonna be susceptible to sclerotinia blight but if you're uh, looking and growing it in Mississippi or Craighead County, that's hopefully not an issue. It is resistant to tomato spotted wilt, uh, but some of the others we just don't know. Uh, I would assume it's probably susceptible to late leaf spot, which uh, a lot of those varieties are. Um, Andy, did you see anything different uh, in some of your uh, variety plots this year or, or maybe where growers had that on their farm, what they might've seen? No, I did not. We walked the plots quite often this summer looking for any differences. And we, we honestly did not even see any Southern black in those fields, the two plots that we had, uh, very little, if any. We saw them in your plots, uh, you know, we saw the Southern black there. But as far as in the large block plots, we just didn't pick up any. Doesn't mean we didn't miss it, just didn't pick it up. So I didn't notice any differences, no. All right. Um and, and Andy, I'm gonna come back to you on, on this next question too. It's, it's kind of a little bit about irrigation. I'll, I'll let you, uh, first is kind of uh, overhead and, and versus furrow irrigation and uh, kind of how often do we need to be irrigating peanuts? Uh, what, what, what do you think about that as far as what you've seen these past couple of years? Well, I guess that comes to the grower you wanna to talk to. I've got some growers tell me they water it like they do cotton, which is about every five to seven days. And then I've got growers that do it more like peanuts, which is about every eight, nine days. Um, and again, I think your soil type is going to obviously affect that. If you're on a sandy soil, you're going to have to come back a little quicker maybe than on the loamy soils. And uh, I think most of the growers did a pretty good job. We did see the, as you said in your talk, the pivot corners definitely had some big time uh, problems with the uh, spider mites and things like that. And we saw the aspergillus in there in those spots. So, I uh, know the take home is, is don't quit too early. We had some in 19 that we're kind of thinking about stopping too early. And we talked to them about, you know, let's, let's don't do that till we uh, increase our chance of aflatoxin. So um, that's what I've seen with it. And that's just about all I can add to that. 
Yeah, I, I, I would kind of agree with that. I think from my pathology mind, when I think of a center pivot, it really helps to get the fungicide down into the lower canopy, especially for diseases like Southern blight. That does add a challenge with the, the row water type system. But I will say that with the row water, at least you can get to every corner most of the time. You don't really have a dry land corner. Um, and then, as you said, too, the end of the season is kind of the, the real kicker. When do you shut that off? Um, and, of course, we don't terminate peanuts by shutting off the water. We, we terminate them by uh, their maturity and when they're ready to harvest. So there's a question here about uh, a pod rotting. Um, and could we see that with, uh, without above ground symptoms? And uh, yes, uh, we can see pod rotting with, with Southern blight. Um, there is some of the subterranean uh, infection that does happen. Um, those are probably the most frustrating to me that uh, uh, there, we could have protected those, but we, we didn't get the fungicide down into the soil. And sometimes that's a limitation of being in a real water irrigation system. And, and there's, you're trying to time that with a rain and, and that's uh, tough to do with a yard, much less in a, in a field type situation. So those can be difficult to, uh, uh, to manage. Uh, so, but certainly something that is, is manageable if we can time it with a rainfall or uh, increasing the amount of, of, of water volume we can when we're actually spraying it out into the field. I got a, a question here from uh, about uh, uh, baling peanut hay um, and about its, its economics. And, um, you know, I don't have any specific numbers that say how much you can get from that. I, I think I heard somewhere that uh, uh, somebody was rolling it up on uh, and, the, and the farmer was getting $12 per bale. Uh, certainly that can be uh, uh, additional funding for the farmer. Um, so I, I would encourage if that's something interested. I know when I grew up as a, my grandfather was a peanut farmer, we bailed up all our hay. Um, the only disadvantage to that is if you're looking at for nitrogen credit in the, the peanut field, uh, you could potentially lose about 25 to 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So you're going to have to add that back uh, if, if you pull the, the peanut hay off the field. So uh, but certainly if it's a, a dry year in other states like Oklahoma or Texas or needing hay, it can certainly be profitable and it's a, it's a very good uh, uh, quality peanut hay. So, uh, sorry, I, I keep seeing some of the questions uh, about the uh, rotation with wheat. Um, and, um, you know, I kind of took a stab at it. Uh, this one is actually, if we run wheat and soybeans within the same year, and corn the next year. Um, my only concern with uh, you know, the wheat or the soybeans again would be the timing. I, th I think wheat and soybeans work good as far as rotation. I think corn after wheat would actually be a, um, an issue. Tom, is there any uh, herbicide related issues with that type of scenario? Uh, with uh, corn following wheat? That's or, what uh, I, I think I understand from the question. Now I may have it completely wrong, but that's. Uh, I think the corn, the way I'm reading that is the corn the next year. So they did wheat and soybean double crop and then corn the next year. Okay. And I was sitting here, sitting here trying, and that's fine. I mean, you're not going to be able to plant corn right after wheat. I don't guess. I mean, unless you kill the wheat, because that's a later, a lot later planting date. Uh, but I guess you could, it might just uh, be willing to accept reduced yields or whatever, but. Uh, I took that question as meaning, can we substitute the peanuts for the beans in, st in that rotation system? So in other words, use, you know, plant the wheat, then double crop peanuts behind that, and then come back with corn the next year. But I think you answered that earlier, maybe, but, but I would think the peanuts have such a long growing season. That would be hard if you're planting them in, in June. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that would be my concern too, is just getting them because they're a 150 day crop. The closer you get into November, you're not getting the heat units that you normally would. So they're really starting to slow down. Keep in mind, peanuts are really a, a tropical plant that actually came from Peru. So we're probably at the furthest north that I would care to grow, although I know there's some in Missouri. So 
just like you know last year, there's going to be those limitations where uh, we're not able to mature even in you know October. So, well, if you bump into November, and we've done that a couple of years, and just like you and I had our trials in 2019, we didn't harvest anything. It just kept raining and raining and raining. So that would be my my biggest concern or, or what I'd be worried about the most. Yeah, and, and with any rotation, uh, Travis, you know, they just need to check our either our replant guidelines. We've got an MP for that, or there's a lot of them in the MP44, too, that talk about replant intervals to peanuts. And, and the trouble is, when I get questions about that, uh, the uh, a lot of herbicide labels, if the residue work to peanuts and the tolerance work has not been done, they just use an automatic 18 month restriction on that replant. And so it becomes difficult to know sometimes what actually, if it's a real replant restriction or if it's just a designated 18 months, cause they didn't do the, didn't do the uh, tolerance work. All right. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I've done a little bit of this. This is a kind of a basic fertility uh, question, and, and I don't know, Andy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bat this one over to you to see if you, uh, maybe working with some of the farmers, what your, what your thoughts on here. Uh, what are the basic fertilizer applications for P and K for, for maintenance and general fertility when it comes to peanuts? You, got, uh, you had any of that questions last year? Basically, what we say is, is, you know, if you soil test your ground and you've got a really good soil reserve of P and K, um, you probably don't have to have any, but I'd still want to put a base amount, you know, to a, kind of a build, you might say, just to make sure that you're not uh, removing too much. But it, it doesn't take a lot to make a really good peanut crop. That's one thing I've read in all the research and I've seen a lot of our growers. Some don't fertilize, but I think it's still a pretty good idea to put a base. And back to your question on on hay while ago, or not hay, but the other uh, peanut hay. One other thing I'd add, I think I would talk to a forage guy too. I think you're going to see the same thing as we do in corn. I know in 2012, a lot of guys bailed up corn stubble thinking they're going to get a double income, but you're pulling a lot of P and K off in that stubble. And I think you're going to do the same thing in peanuts. So if you sell that hay, take that money and put it back in fertilizer. If you're helping somebody out with P hay, uh, excuse me, peanut hay, don't forget the, you may be depleting that also. All right, good, good, uh, good comment there, Andy. Thanks, um, Tom. This, this last one here about off-target herbicide issues that will impact peanut production. Yes, I can, I can think of the one with dicamba is probably the one. Maybe it's coming to mind. What's your, what's your thoughts there? I think that's probably the the biggest one as far as off-target movement is concerned. Uh, peanuts are a legume crop, and most legume crops are very sensitive to dicamba. But I will say that that peanut is the most tolerant of the, of the legume crops that we grow in Arkansas anyway to those, uh, to that off target potential, uh, from dicamba. And so, you know, it's, it's not near as sensitive as soybeans. So you're not going to see it near as readily, uh, or easily, I guess, from a symptomology standpoint. Now, uh, there has, we haven't done any work here in Arkansas, but there's been a lot of work done on, uh, dicamba off target movement in Georgia. And uh, it takes a fairly significant rate of off-target movement dicamba to uh, negatively impact peanut yield is what they've seen over there. Yeah, that's what I do remember from, from uh, some of Prosco's uh, uh, report. So, yeah, thanks. So the, the last question I guess I'll take uh, since it's a nematode-related issue is uh, how soon will peanuts lower the, the root knot population and and uh, given that it's the southern root knot is, is one season. So it's, uh, it doesn't mean it's completely immune. It's just a, a very poor host. Uh, you can actually go in at the end of the season and, and sample and, and hit that you could find a few of uh, J2. So uh, again, it's not immune, but that those numbers can go from uh, extremely high to undetectable after one cropping season. But uh, the, the next time you plant a susceptible cotton or susceptible soybean, those numbers can rebound to where they were before. So it's a, it's a management uh, program. It's, it's kind of like all of us uh, for managing blood pressure or something else. It's something you consistently do for your, your lifetime. You just don't do it one time and you're done. So uh, 
uh, that's how I would kind of approach that. Well, I, I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate everybody's questions, uh, your time and attention. Um, and um, thanks for attending our um, virtual peanut production meeting. Uh, again, I would like to thank the, uh, the Arkansas Peanut Growers uh, and the National Peanut Board for uh, their support uh, in this research and extension programs. Um, and if you, uh, if you have other questions, certainly reach out to us. I know uh, uh, as I look at the number of people that were on the list and I recognize a lot of names that were there. So thank you all for joining our virtual peanut production meeting. I hope you enjoyed this meeting. Uh, we do have a couple of additional meetings yet uh, on the books. One of us our marketing and new technologies and irrigation meeting that will be on January 28th. And then our final uh, swinging production meeting, which will be on February the 2nd. And the registration for those are on the same website where uh, you found uh, to register for this. So thank you all. Uh, have a, a great afternoon and a great evening. Thank you.